from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips. Our guest for this broadcast is Dr. Stephen Mosher, the author of an important new book, Hegemon. Dr. Mosher has provided leadership on issues relating to the defense of innocent human life domestically here in the United States as head of the Population Research Institute. And he's done his part by being the father of eight children, a, an accomplishment of which he can and should be very proud. In the 1970s, indeed in 1979, Dr. Mosher was one of the first Americans to spend a considerable amount of time in Communist China, the People's Republic of China. And while he was there, uh, he told the truth in exposing the forced abortion policy imposed by Beijing, the one ch uh, family, one child policy. Dr. Mosher, let's uh, begin by asking how it was that you wound up in Communist China in 1979. Well, you know I got in a lot of trouble because I went to Communist China in 1979, the first American scholar to be allowed in that country to live and work and study in a Chinese village. In fact, I never did get my doctorate. Stanford Uni University refused to give me the PhD after I reported on China's policy of forced abortion and forced sterilization. In what area was your PhD? I was, I was going through a program of uh, study in anthropology, mm -hmm. but I was really what we call a sinologist, a China watcher. I was studying mm -hmm. the Chinese language, Chinese history. China's history is the dominant power of Asia and, and of course, the future hegemon of the world. And uh, it was a great opportunity for me to go to China in 1979, or so I thought. I was in the first wave of American scholars to go. In fact, I was the only one who was turned down by the Chinese government. There were 49 scholars who were accepted. They were nuclear physicists and chemists and engineers, and China wanted them to come to China so they could pick their brains. Me, they wanted to keep out, and it was only when the matter was brought to the personal attention of Deng Xiaoping, the fellow we used to call China's paramount leader, now dead, that Deng said, oh, it's all right, let him come. And I had permission from so Deng Xiaoping even, himself. even communists make mistakes. And, and they made a big mistake in my <laughs> case because, you see, with Deng Xiaoping's permission to be there, no one dared get in my way. And so when the local militia held bomb-throwing, well, grenade-throwing practices, I was there. When the local Communist Party branch held its secret meetings, I was there. And when China began its one-child policy, arresting women for the crime of being pregnant, taking them in for forced abortions. I went along with them, with my notepad, and with my tape recorder, and with my camera. And so I was able to document these massive human rights abuses. The millions of women have been wounded in China by forced abortion and forced sterilization. Of course, all of their babies have died as a result. Mm. Has anything improved since 1979 in China? You know, that's a, that's a very pivotal question, because a lot of people say things are getting better in China, China's going our way. We, All we have to do is sit back and wait, and they're going to become just like well, us. Well, not wait. We have to give them $84 billion well, a year in most favored nation trade advantages. And, 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 that, and billions of dollars in, in investment and our most modern technology, and then we have to sit idly by while they steal our nuclear secrets and penetrate our uh, nuclear weapons labs. China has not changed. In fact, in many respects, life in China today, from the standpoint of human rights, from the standpoint of freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, political freedom, things are worse today than they were 15 or 20 years ago. This is something that, that most Americans don't realize, but they have to understand. This regime is stronger now today because of trade with the United States. It's stronger now because it has the largest part foreign currency reserves of any country in the world. It's stronger now because it's stolen military secrets from us. And it is better able, therefore, to oppress its people than it was 15 years ago. They now have surveillance equipment purchased from American companies that enable them to eavesdrop on conversations held in private homes. They have uh, top flight elect electrical uh, equipment from the United States. So they use the Internet uh, to, to, keep, uh, to keep watch over dissidents. We are empowering this government. We are making it stronger, not just militarily, but stronger in terms of oppressing its own people. China's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, Steve, uh, Bill Clinton was well paid for the assistance he gave to the communist regime in China. What is the motivation for George Bush the elder and George Bush the lesser to provide the kind of support they do 
to communist China in terms of military exchanges, in terms of declining to provide the uh, Aegis uh, defense system to Taiwan, in terms of uh, uh, permission for technology transfers. What is the motive for Republicans to do what Bill Clinton did? Well, you know, the, the, the elder George Bush had a great love for China. And he fell in love with China in the 70s when a lot of us thought of China as our ally. Now, those of us who were paying attention realized that we could never really be close to a country that imprisoned uh, Christians, for example. The, the, the Nixon-Kissinger argument. But the whole Nixon-Kissinger yeah. argument that we're going to play the China card, that China is going to be a counterweight to the Soviet Union, and therefore we have to overlook, we have to close our eyes, we have to not listen to the cries of imprisoned dissidents in China because we have a greater purpose, that of containing the Soviet Union. Now, George Bush Sr. bought into that. He was part of that. He was the representative, as you know, in, in Beijing for 18 months during the late 1970s. He and his wife, Barbara, used to ride bikes around China and were, were just captivated by, by you know, Chinese culture and language, and the hosts were very nice and so forth. They had great banquets. But uh, that all changed in the late 80s. It changed with Tiananmen, the killing of unarmed students in the main square of the city. Uh, it changed because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, because if we did need China as a counterweight to the Soviet Union, and the, I don't think we did. The, I think China's the, the China weight. card strategy changed, but even after Tiananmen Square, Bush was moving to overlook it. He and was. He was. He was trying to call. I mean, I will never forget the press conference that 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 the former President Bush held. Uh, I think it was on on uh, June sixth, a couple days after the massacre, when we had seen on our television sets the full horror of what was happening in Beijing. And he was asked if there had been any contact with the Chinese government. He said, well, I've been trying to call my old friend Deng Xiaoping to find out how this tragedy could have happened. Well, he was trying to call a brutal communist dictator who was, who was moving against a popular uprising by using deadly force. I mean, there's no surprise in that. That's what uh, the Soviet Union did in Hungary in 1956. That's what they later did in Poland. Uh, that's what the communists did again and again throughout the history of the last century. What could be surprising about the use of deadly force against their own citizens? Uh, it took him a long time to abandon his illusions. He apparently never read that Deng Xiaoping in September of 1991 declared that there was a new Cold War. Now, this was after the collapse of the Soviet Union, after the Tiananmen Massacre. The leader of China stood up and said, there's a new Cold War. Between who? The Soviet Union had collapsed, but there was now a new Cold War between China and the United States. And this has been the operating principle of Communist China for the last 10 years. They have declared uh, a decade ago now that there's a new Cold War, and they are planning uh, for, that, for that confrontation with the United States. Where have we been for the last 10 years? Of course, years? one of the problems is that people who have been entrusted by our government with positions of extraordinary responsibility have gone on the payroll of communist China, directly and indirectly. Henry Kissinger, no. Brent no. Scowcroft, Alexander Haig, and others have uh, been paid well to be apologists for a pro-communist Chinese policy. And, and I do hold uh, the former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, responsible for this practice, because Henry Kissinger was the first former Secretary of State who, after leaving office, used the connections he had made while on the government's payroll, while working for us, you and I, to then go out and sign lucrative contracts to represent private companies in, in, in seeking investment opportunities in countries that he had formally dealt with as Secretary of State. And once he did that, then all subsequent Secretaries of State... Once he did it with impunity. Once he did it with impunity, once he did it without massive criticism from the foreign policy establishment from Americans as a whole, then uh, former ambassadors to China followed. I mean, the only former ambassador to the People's Republic of China that I'm aware of who has preserved his, his integrity and his honesty is Ambassador Jim Lilly. Um, I may, there may be others, but as far as I'm aware, uh, many, if not all, of the others have gone into business with China, again, profiting from the connections they made as our official government representative in Beijing to then go into I don't always agree themselves. with Jim Lilly, but I share your regard for his integrity. I had the privilege of being hosted by him when he was Consul General in Hong Kong in the early 1980s, and I followed his uh, career since then, and I think his 
observations are always well worth listening to, if not always uh, agreeing with. Uh, so you have the Republican Party of two minds about this. The one wing says uh, the almighty dollar is the only thing that's important. Let's go make a fast buck in China. Let's close our eyes to the human rights violations. And their argument, of course, is if we trade and invest with China, that China will change and become like us. And then you have the other wing, the principal conservatives, who say, look, China does not share our values and institutions. This is not a democratic regime. It, there is no prospect of it becoming democratic anytime soon. It's a massive violator of human rights, one of the worst abuses of human rights in the world. We cannot trade and invest in a country that is so far removed from the civilized standards of behavior. We, we can't have the Olympics in a country like that. We, one of the signs of uh, hope is that there is a growing Christian church in China, uh, and uh, the, f the fact that there is there are continuing reports of suppression of that church is a sign that it is growing, however covertly, and with uh, what difficulty. What observations and do it's, you have? You know, on it's that? a sign of hope both in the supernatural, because obviously we want to see uh, the Christian church grow in China. We want to see the gospel spread in that country. It's a sign of hope in the natural, because it's the Christian church, after all, that by propagating the Ten Commandments uh, became the basis for the rule of law. China today. Uh, uh, is a country that, that was never historically evangelized, was never part of historic Christendom, and it is a lawless society. It is not what you know in China, it's who you know. It's sanctity not what of the contract is an alien concept. Uh, there, are, there is no sanctity of contract. It's whatever official happens to read what's on the dotted line, and he makes up the rules as he goes along. And, and that society has its own limitations, but the way to get from a lawless society to one based on law is to understand that there is a lawgiver, a divine lawgiver, and that once you accept and recognize that these commandments exist uh, in your relationship with God, then you start practicing them in your relationship to man, and society changes. We need to remember that in the United States as well. We're going to have to take a break now. When we come back, I want to talk about your book, I'd also like to uh, get your take on what is happening geostrategically in the South China Sea and Southeast Asia. What are Communist China's near-term and long-term military and geostrategic objectives? Stay with us. We'll return right after these messages. Hello, I'm Howard Phillips. The Conservative Caucus has been actively fighting since 1974 for less expensive government and lower taxes imposed upon the American people by the federal government. If you want to become part of our effort to reduce the size and cost and regulatory burden of the federal government, I hope you will call the number shown on your screen. For more information about the Conservative Caucus, write us at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180, or call 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, and during this broadcast, we have the pleasure of chatting with Stephen Mosher, the head of the Population Research Institute. Steve, before we get back to Communist China, tell us something about the work of the Population Research Institute. Well, we, we make the case that, that babies are not a burden, they're a blessing. We make the case that, that people are the ultimate resource, as uh, my late friend Julian Simon used to say, that without people, you have nothing. And people actually cause prosperity. Yeah, now, Simon was one of the great uh, explainers of the myth of overpopulation. The, the, uh, those who are anti-life suggest that there are too many people. And, uh, and he exploded that brilliantly. Yeah, and we know that, that, that people don't cause poverty. People cause prosperity. Because when you have more people, you get temporary shortages and certain goods. You have entrepreneurs in a free society 
with a free market, with uh, protection for property rights and intellectual property rights, you have entrepreneurs come in and create new processes for producing more goods more cheaply. And at the end of the day, because of population growth, you have higher standards of living. We've seen that again and again in the history of the last two centuries. And as our numbers have grown, so has our prosperity. But we face a crisis now. We face a crisis in fertility in many, many countries around the world. Half the countries of the world are having too few children to replace themselves. Well, and that means that countries like Italy, countries like Spain are literally dying. They're filling more coffins each year than cradles. Think of that. More and, coffins yeah. than cradles. And Islam is replacing Christianity. Uh, Christianity as uh, they fill their employment needs through an influx of people from other cultures and other countries. Well, Europe, if, if the Europeans aren't willing to have enough children themselves to keep their economy going, uh, to, to, to fill those needed slots mm -hmm. uh, in different kinds of occupations, then they're going to have to import laborers, and that will necessarily change the character Islam of Europe over time. Islam is defeating Christianity in the bedrooms of Europe. Well, Islam has been better at protecting its families from from abortion and, and from the pernicious notion that somehow uh, unborn children and, and, and young children are our enemies and not the blessings that they truly are. So we make pronatal arguments. Uh, we just published a booklet called Ten Great Reasons to Have Another Child, talking about how children who come into the world are blessings not just for their family, their immediate family, but for their aunts and uncles, their extended family, their grandparents how they're blessings for the community because they bring love and help into the, their, their local social setting, how they're blessings for the economy because they grow up, they take jobs, uh, they provide necessary services uh, for other people, uh, they keep Social Security afloat, they start play, paying taxes and enabling other people now retired to continue to receive their Social Security benefits. Mm -hmm. So they really help us in many, many ways. So we're on the other side of the population question. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't think we have too many people in the world. We think we have too few. And your training uh, some of your blessings. You and your wife are homeschooling your eight children. We, we have a lot of fun with the homeschooling. Uh, I can't take credit for the homeschooling because my wife does most of it. Uh, she homeschools our oldest uh, five children and then we have uh, our oldest, oldest six children and then we have Luke who's four and our youngest Kiar who's 18 months and it'll be a while before they can sit still long enough at the dinner table to learn their <laughs> lessons. But it's going well. They're all mm -hmm. ahead of grade. You know, homeschoolers do very well in academic terms and they do very well in terms of socialization as well because within a large family they learn how to get along with people who are older and younger, mm -hmm. with older brothers and younger brothers, older sisters, younger sisters, and we have lots of activities with other homeschooling families. So they, mm -hmm. they really learn how in a way that um, children who are schooled with, with kids of their own age, and only with kids of their own age, homeschool kids really learn how to get along with all ages, uh, with mm -hmm. the elderly, with the middle aged, with the young. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the book Hegemon. Well, I wrote the book Hegemon because I've been following China for the last 25 years. And I, my interest in China, really 30 years now, time goes by, my interest in China dates back to the Vietnam War. I was an officer in the Navy during the Vietnam War. And we knew at that time that the principal support of North Vietnam in terms of arms, materiel, and, and manpower was, was China. Some was coming from the Soviet Union, but China was the principal backer. And I longed for the day when it would be possible for me to go to China and study that society close up. That opportunity came in the late 1970s, as we've talked about. And I saw the Chinese communist regime close up, unvarnished. I was there for a year long enough to see through the, the, the Potemkin village, the facade, the pretense that things had gotten better for the Chinese people. I was there long enough to make friends and have my Chinese friends tell me that things were actually worse now, now being 19, 1980, uh, than they had been before the communists came to power. A remarkable statement that things hadn't gotten better in 30 years, they'd actually gotten worse. And I was there for the beginning of the one-child policy, which tragically continues today, and it, under which seven to 13 million abortions are done every year, and equal number of sterilizations and countless numbers of uh, contraceptions. And uh, what, in your view, on the basis of what you've seen and experienced, is the near-term strategic plan of Beijing, and what is the long-term plan? Well, I don't think they've made any secret about their near-term plans. I think they've been very clear that they want Taiwan back, and they want it back now and that they will use force, if necessary, to recover that free island uh, where 22 million Chinese live and govern themselves uh, under a democratic government. 
They've also made no bones about the fact that they want the South China Sea, lock, stock, and oil barrel. Now, the South China Sea, of course, is a huge sea, mm -hmm. the size of the Caribbean that lies between China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam. Many, many countries have claims on the islands in the South you know, China and, Sea. And Beijing has been bribing uh, oil companies in the West by offering them concessions, which they really mm -hmm. have no right to offer. Mm -hmm. But uh, no other country is strong enough to challenge them. The Philippines, the others in the area, uh, have at least as valid a claim to the Spratly Islands, for Absolutely. example. Absolutely. The Spratlys and the Paracel Islands dot the South China Sea. And China's claimed the whole thing. And they did this 10 years ago without consulting their neighbors. They simply declared one day that they owned the South China Sea. This is a very aggressive action. And they have begun to try to interdict shipping in the South China Sea. If they don't like ships coming through, they will stop them and they will examine their cargo. They tried recently to stop uh, s several Australian frigates mm -hmm. from traversing the Taiwan Straits. These are international waters. These should be open to, to, to flagships of all nations. Now, they have indicated that if the United States were to militarily defend the independence of the Republic of China on Taiwan, that uh, no target, no American target would be beyond uh, their purpose, that they would attack our aircraft carriers. Indeed, a few years ago, one of their top military people said they would launch nuclear weapons on Los Angeles. Do they have the power to do these things? Well, China has a couple dozen Long March missiles, which, uh, thanks to the the previous administration, the Clinton administration, are now probably being equipped with miniature nuclear warheads based on U.S. plans and put on on top of these, uh, in the nose cones of these warheads, probably eight or ten to, to a nose cone using a MIRVing technology, multiple independent reentry vehicle technology that was again approved for export to China by President Clinton. So China has national now... national security advisor. Sandy Berger had some very questionable ties. Well, he had been in business with China before taking office, and of course we don't know what he's doing now, but, but, but you shouldn't have as your national security advisor someone who's principally interested in, in, in trading and uh, investing in China. You should have someone who's principally interested in the national security of the United States. You think that would be implicit in the title. But anyway, China has the means to threaten American cities. It's now building two new generation missiles, uh, the DF-30 and the DF-31, the Dongfang, Dongfang meaning east wind, uh, which are going to be capable of reaching the United States as well. And these are solid fuel missiles that can be launched uh, on a moment's notice. So the strategic threat to the United States is not just Taiwan. Uh, there is now a strategic threat to the American homeland from the People's Republic of China, from a government that really did what Brezhnev and Khrushchev and the old Soviet Union never no. did, directly threatened uh, the nuclear annihilation of American cities. This is an incredibly crude and threatening thing to do, and we would be foolish to ignore no. such threats. I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, I was assigned uh, Mackinda for reading about geostrategy, and he taught us about choke points and sea lanes of communication mm -hmm. supply and uh, the importance of various land masses, etc. But it doesn't appear that our political figures today have ever heard of Mackinder or certainly have not taken his lessons to heart, but Beijing has. Uh, Li ka Sheng, a prominent Hong Kong businessman with close ties to the Beijing government, has a company called Hutchison Wampoa and mm -hmm. his various mm -hmm. other names, and they've been methodically uh, establishing a presence at key choke points and port facilities all over the world. They're at the Suez Canal, mm -hmm. they're in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. they're in Vancouver, they're in Panama. Um, these fellows are thinking ahead. Well, they are, and, and this, is not, this is not new strategy. I mean, Britain controlled the waves, you know, Britannia, Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, the old saying went, because Great Britain had a small army, but she had a large navy and she controlled the Suez Canal the Cape of Good Hope. She controlled uh, the Straits of Malacca between Singapore and Southeast Asia. She controlled, uh, well, she had through her ally, the United States, access to the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. And that's what enabled Great Britain to project force everywhere in the world quickly. Well, China is trying to obtain control over these maritime strategic choke points. And these have been designed by geography. I mean, they don't change over time. They've now gotten, uh, are getting control of the Straits of Malacca between Singapore and uh, 
and, and Southeast Asia, they're supporting the independence movement in Sumatra, part of Indonesia, uh, which is right opposite the Straits of Malacca. They're doing it, why? Because they want control of those straits through which oil goes to Korea and Taiwan and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, they want uh, the oil reserves on Sumatra itself. So they, they really do have hegemonic ambitions. They, they have hegemonic ambitions. It's not just Taiwan. It's not just Southeast Asia. It's not just uh, the South China Sea. It's our continent. It's our hemisphere. It's the Panama Canal. It's Cuba. People I respect ha have made the case very persuasively that uh, communist China is a far greater threat to U.S. security actually and potentially than the Soviet Union ever was. Mm -hmm. When we return from this break, uh, I would like you to repeat something I heard you say at a uh, meeting uh, several weeks ago about what the United States is doing to monitor red Chinese capabilities. Stay with us. We'll be back with Dr. Stephen Mosher, and I awarded the doctorate. Uh, Thank you. Uh, because he deserves it, right after these messages. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. Steve Mosher, how many people are watching China for the U.S. government? Not nearly enough. We have about 30 people in the Central Intelligence Agency who are watching China. We need about 300 or maybe 3,000. How many watched the Soviet Union? We had 1,000 watching the Soviet Union 15 years of ago. Of the 30 people watching Red China for America, how many speak Mandarin or Cantonese? Not many. As far as I know, one. One. Does. Thank you for being with us. 